Okay, and welcome back to Fast Ship Performance then. My name is Tim Davies and I'm back in my attack shack then, ready to drop some truth bombs on your personal battlefields, helping you to win the wars you are fighting. And we are fighting some wars out there, FJP fam. We're looking at toxic presidential race. We're looking at, what, Brexit, culture wars. We're looking at the coronavirus pandemic disease on the streets. And who is the doctor they told you to go see? Dr. FJP. And I've got some medicine with me today because I am in session now, I've got a wingman to help me drop those truth bombs. Well, it's actually because we're in Diversity and Inclusion Week, a wing person. She is also a swing wing messenger of death, okay? A front seat pilot of this airplane up here. Boom! The greatest bomber you can ever fly in the whole world, although now out of service, unfortunately. So Mandy Hickson, as I said, fight pilot, speaker, and a best-selling author. And she's basically come to our Warrior Wednesday, as we're going to call it at the moment, to help me drop those bombs for you. Now, before we bring Mandy on, guys, we've got a little bit of domestics and some housekeeping. Bring them a window over here, then. What I'm going to do is go through a few banners and explain the ground rules. This is me, Tim Davis, Fast Ship Performance, as you know. Now, when Mandy's speaking, we're going to go over enough topics, some, some really good stuff from the book, but we're also going to talk about high performance, mental health, and uh, what the mindset, what a negative mindset can do for you and help you or stop you achieving the things that you need to be achieving in your life, as we know. So if you want to ask Mandy a question as she is talking about a particular subject, there is something called Super Chat, guys. Get involved, support the channel, look at the banner at the bottom. If you want to talk to Mandy during that, drop it in the super chat and then she's going to see it on the screen live on the screen and she's going to answer that so that will give you like a real-time answer if however you just want to ask a question at the end not supporting the channel it's youtube i totally get it but then write your question in capital letters that's really important guys questions use capitals um if you're not in the super chat and then what happens at the end when mandy and i have exhausted all topics to be spoken about in the entire world I will scroll down those questions and I will try and get as many answered for you as I possibly can because she has a fountain of information. You don't want to miss this. It's going to be awesome. The last thing I will say, guys, um, if you do also, if you want to sponsor the channel, uh, the basic or the advanced on Patreon is a really great place to go. We've got um, webinars for the basic guys and you get 30, sec uh, 30 minutes every month with me for the advance and a one-to-one -one and everything. That's fantastic. I really appreciate it. Right. Mandy's written a book, An Officer, Not a Gentleman, The Inspirational Journey of a Pioneering female fighter pilot. Um, I read that book again yesterday. I've re I read it when it first came out. I've got some hard questions for her. I'm probably more current in the reading of her book than she is, which is brilliant. So I want to bring on now, uh, I want to bring Mandy on without further ado. So let's get you into the stream, Andy. Right. Andy, how are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm going to be talking swing wing superheroes. Yes, we are. <laughs> there's no, exactly. no Harrier chat in here. No bit this noz noz, right? No, exactly. And it's lovely to see all the banter about us being five minutes late. Of course, you know, time on target. <laughs> I'll be fair about that, to be honest. The, the, the five minutes late is I'm dealing with a program here and my hands are zip zipping all over the place. If you can see the setup in this room, there's lamps. There's It's like a studio in here. And what I didn't want to do is rush mandy into getting straight on quickly and give you a bad service so i do apologize for that um but i like i should have that should have started on time so if it didn't on the replay i'll uh debrief I myself that. yes you, mandy was there mandy was there time on target absolutely mandy look really great to have you here i really want to speak about your book but i also don't want to um give too much away about your book because there's some great lessons in there for everyone and when i read it i remember laughing at well, I was thinking I was three years behind you. I remember laughing at some of the same bits, thinking, oh, my God, that didn't change. That didn't change at all. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? It's always, yeah. oh, God, really? Yeah, yeah, I know. Right, so I'm going to look at the questions here. People are going to put some in. But the first thing we're going to talk about, Dan Denham, what's going on there? My brother. Oh, Harry. I saw him, Dan, Dan Denham. Denham. I didn't oh. see him, buddy. Hello, what mate. have you done? What have you done? Bringing people in like Dan. That's outrageous. And I will see names in it because it's a good crowd, by the way. They all come in. Ben, what's going on, brother? Andy Nichols, how you doing? I see all these same names. I want to talk um, about the end of your book first. Um, and I don't think we're giving too much away, but it's a very important thing to me. I do a lot of work with uh, young girls and I do, um, well, uh, well, about 16 year old, really. So young women on confidence issues. And I do a lot of work with ethnic minorities as well. Uh, on a very similar subject, I think you brought up at the end of your book, Mandy, which was to do with um, self-esteem and low confidence. Can you just give us uh, a, a few minutes on that? 
Yeah, so I'll just give you a very quick summary, canter through the story that I finished the book on. I don't think it's a spoiler, is it, if I do? You know? No, not at all. I don't think so. But Great I'm story. Flying, um, flying with cadets as a volunteer reservist. I go back at the weekends. I was flying with cadets from Air Training Corps. And um, last cadet of the day, see her walking out and thinking, my face drops because she's looking really demoralised. You know, the weight of her world, the world is on her shoulders and stuff, as well as the parachute, you know. And uh, she gets in, I take her flying, basically, and it transpires after much grunting, you know, very little response from her that she's actually probably one of the most natural, talented pilots I've ever flown with. And it would, it would have been really easy for me to switch off and not be, you know, engaged with her because actually she was giving me no signals that she was even interested, let alone keen on this. And at the end, we landed this flight and I said, you know what, Emily, you're one of the best pilots I've ever flown with. And she said, I bet you say that to everyone, you know. Uh, I speak team now because I have to. Um, and, she said, and, and she, I said, I've never said it to anybody, you know. And I said, you know, is this something you might want to do? And it was in that moment when we finally got this eye contact, which I'll tell you was challenging because she had so much eye makeup on. I thought, you know, when we got airborne, I was wondering when the G-force would prevent her from opening her eyes with this mascara. Um, and, and I said, you know, is this something you want to do? And she said, this is all I've ever wanted to do. But I was so nervous before coming flying. And I was so scared I was going to fail, I decided not to show you I was interested, not to try. And it was like this moment of just horror, because I just thought, how many of us do, do, do we back away from things that we really want? Because we think, what happens if I, fa if I fail at it? And you get gripped by a fear of failure. And, and I know it's sort of happened to me, but I've learned to overcome that and make, yes, my default setting, as opposed to thinking, no, straight away. And, you know, and I said, but, you know, she said, if I tried really hard and then I failed, what would I be able to blame it on? And that's how our brains work, isn't it? We think, I can't do something, so it's better not to try. And I said, you know, how many opportunities are you going to miss unless you grab things with both hands? And I said, you know, how are you doing at school? And she said, well, I hate that. And I said, well, that enables this. And so it's about matching the two things together, isn't it, in your own mind and saying, do you know what? If I truly want something, yes, it's going to be hard work. But now I've got a reason. I've got the purpose behind why I'm doing it. And I think when we go into schools, and you and I do do this a lot, people don't have the purpose because they don't know what they want to do. And I think that's the majority of people out there have no idea what they want to do. And if you don't know what you want to do, why does trying hard at school make sense then? It doesn't. Yeah. I so say it's like, yeah, I say it's like getting into a car, isn't it, with a sat nav and trying to drive to a destination you haven't put in. Yeah, 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 it's exactly like that, you know. And I do really, really feel, you know, for, for so many people in that environment. I and mean, I've got two sons a little bit like that myself at the moment, you know, without that purpose. And it's difficult. It's um, You're in a great place here in FJP. We talk about failing forward. We talk about fail as first attempt in learning. So we have to fail in order to get to where we want to go. You know from flying training, I mean, it's in your book, isn't it, about the fact that, I mean, you can fail on ops, of course, you know, and hopefully, you know, we're not, we're not killed and we can take the jet back without dropping, but we, you know, we, we still come back with our lives. But, um, and that's that's covered in your book as well in some detail. I really like that. But FJP, we highlight failure uh, yeah. as a necessity, as a necessity, you know, it has to be. Um, so I, I just thought it was a great story about the young lady and it, it was in the real, ex it was a really great place of the book as well. It kind of summed it up so well. Everything you said up to that point, was about that and then you said i've just seen it in someone else yeah you know and I think uh, yeah you wrote a really interesting blog a, a while ago now actually tim and it was about actually um i think it was a girl you'd been flying with actually and she failed and you almost said i was sort of in some ways you were relieved that she had failed because failing at that point would actually build her resilience and the grit and the determination for the for the things in the future and i do think that's a really good point because a lot of people talk to me about how do you become resilient? How do you build grit? We, it's not a gift. You can't give someone resilience. It's it's through lessons learned and really tough lessons learned, you know, and that's how you just build it up. And it's I think that's why things like, say, the sports field for a young person are a really good place to start because you don't always win, you know, and it's gutting when you're a seven year old and you get beaten in a rugby match. But you get over it and you learn to build mechanisms that you're not weeping on the pitch. You know, yeah. and these are mechanisms that help us in life later on. So I do think it's important, that even as young children, we learn that there is often is not always, not everyone is a winner. Yeah, I wrote that about a young lady who's on the um, uh, typhoon now, in fact, and right. she would never have got onto the typhoon. Well, we all knew in the course. The problem with that essay, 
I got a lot of hate from the airline industry, especially yeah. who said, uh, yeah, they were saying, look, if she's passing, then she's passing. And it was like, you don't understand because you're an airline guy and I've not, no issues. Your husband's an airline guy. My brother's an airline guy. Uh, my brother read it and was like, yeah, fair on. Because we failed her, even though she, she wouldn't have necessarily failed on that particular sortie, we knew she was going to fail in the phase and in the flying training. And then to redo that amount of flying is crippling. She never failed anything before in her life, by the way. Um, and so it, it's just crippling when you when you don't fail early. She hadn't had the opportunity to fail. Yeah. And some people were saying, well, maybe she was just too good. And it was like, you don't understand how it is trying to tank at night in a single seat airplane over Syria. You know, I, I've trained pilots that have done that. I've, I've tanked like you've tanked. You've got a great tanking story, <laughs> <laughs> which we may go into a bit later. You know what I mean? But yeah. I think it's a great story because it says, yeah, that's happened. Let's crack on, do something else now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I still get people commenting on Twitter, actually, saying, you know, the decision you made there, it was a good call. And I was like, yeah, it was. It was the only call to make. The only call. Yeah, the so, only call. You know, yeah. it's, it is, you do work in high pressure situations. I think like failing your driving test, I hate to say it, is devastating at the time, but actually it makes you probably a safer driver, bizarrely, because you're not so arrogant. You're thinking this is easy and uh, it's fine. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. I think it's such an important subject. I don't think it's covered enough, by the way. I, I think there's imposter syndrome and there is, um, uh, what do we say it was? Imposter syndrome is the main one where you, where you get into a position where you think I'm not good enough to be here. And then we have self-sabotage, which I see a lot of young people do. And this is what you're saying about the young lady. She was saying, well, I get this from young, well, young men. One of the, one of the biggest demographics I have an issue with at the moment are young white men. It's kind of hard to say it when we're celebrating diversity and inclusion within the military. And I don't want to get into that right now because that's a whole other subject. But there are there are there is a cohort that we're really missing here. And it's young white men not going to university because they don't think that they're good enough to go. Yeah. Um, and so I, I speak to a lot of these young men and I talk them through this whole rationale of self-sabotage. It's like, let someone tell you you're not good enough. Don't decide yourself. Yeah. But you see, I see even in adults, actually, you know, the self-sabotage. And I think, I mean... I'm not going to pull him out as an individual, but someone very close to my heart, <clears throat> younger than me, but may have come from my own loins. Um, but basically, you know, his latest school report read, one of the best leaders determined to not show it in any way, shape or form. And I thought, sums him up perfectly, you know, determined to self-sabotage any natural leadership he has whatsoever. I thought, great, you know, that's that's really wonderful, isn't it? I'm glad that I'm a motivational speaker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, how is that working for you when you start? Well, it's not going well on the parenting front at the moment. I've just yeah. put that one out there, guys. I may have succeeded in certain areas of my life, but in this one, it's a big fat fail at the moment. <laughs> There's your honesty coming through. Right, I'm going through your book now. I've, I've highlighted some notes. Um, one of the things I thought was quite funny, we both know um jace hawker of course he was ex uh red one uh the difference between me and you though man is i didn't try and chat him up in a nightclub yeah in, was, it, was it york before you rocked up and he turned out to be your flying instructor the next day yeah, it was a lovely uh top gun moment in reverse i thought yeah we just finished ground school we were on a high i went out we were clubbing there's this gorgeous bloke i'm like oh hello ladies sidled on up tried a little bit of sweet talking yeah he was having none of it <laughs> That's brilliant. And then and I said, oh, a fast jet pilot, you know, and all this, which I've never seen men run, by the way, so quickly. By the way, if I've got any female fast jet pilots out there, never say it. Just say that you're a teacher or uh, something, because it, it works, I promise. But, uh, yeah, the next morning, on the Monday morning, we go to work, and I walked in, and it wasn't just any instructor. He was my instructor. And he said, ah, and I was like, Oh my God, horror, literally. Oh. And he said, he contacted me recently, actually, Tim, and he said, oh, I completely forgot about that. He said, and he said it on LinkedIn. He said, so hi from Mr. Friday night. You know, I'm like, oh my God, how embarrassing. The clap. I mean, that yeah. could have been a lot worse, though, couldn't it? If you had a few more beers. So you. It really could. It really could. Yeah. Let's put that yeah. down for luck in that one, I think. Right. Um, yeah, we both have a healthy disdain for Harrier pilots, Dan Denham. So that's all right. Yeah. That's in your book there, isn't it? <laughs> I know, don't. I actually even said it. No, I was waiting. We've got another friend, Chris, and he's already started commenting about it as well. I'm like, oh, dear, sorry. No offence to any Harrier pilots out there. You're all lovely as individuals. As individuals is a very good way of putting it. Yeah, absolutely. Right, okay. So one thing I really want to talk about, and you kind of did talk about that a little bit there, so it's a good time to run with it now, is um, I think you single-handedly... Um, I was speaking to Helen Gardner the other day, in fact, at Talis, it was a work thing. And um, I think you, you you, and her must have been about the same era, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, we were. Yeah. I, was, I think I was just a tiny bit in front of her, but yeah. Yeah, so I think, because you were the first female crew to fly 
so well, I say so. You were the first female crew front back to fly in a fast jet in the UK. Yeah, we were, and it was it didn't even get picked up anywhere. Even my mm. boss didn't know. In fact, we didn't even MB it. We flew it, and it was only afterwards I said to my backseat to Helen. Um, it was Helen Dawson at the time, and I said, "I think this is the first all female crew, by the way, in the Tornado GR4." And she, at which point she said, um, "She said, oh right, yeah." So then I wrote this article, which was terrible actually, and this is where you know you've got to be very careful because I wrote. No one ever read my articles that I wrote for the uh, the station magazine, which was Mara Matters. That's right. what it's called. And I wrote and I wrote a headline of two birds do it together in a tornado just to get people's attention so they might read the article. Yeah, let's just say I then went to the Gulf and uh, she was left. She walked into the crew room and the guys had blown this up in literally 100, 200-fold. It was stuck all over the crew room, completely all around. And she walked into two birds do it together in a tornado and she rang me in the Gulf. She went, I don't know who wrote this article, Mandy, but I am furious. And I went, yeah, it was me. <laughs> she was livid. She was really cross. And all I said in it was, it was all the normal chat, you know, from the squadron. And then at the end, it said, oh, by the way, history has been made and two women have finally flown together in a tornado. I said, obviously, they couldn't park it and they took hours before they got out having applied their makeup. You know, it was just a bit of pants, but it was not, it was not well received. I think if I'm right from your book, and I've spoken to you about it before, and of course I've, I've been to see you speak when I first left the military, of course, but you weren't respectfully a girly girl when you went through. No. <laughs> no, I, but I was me. And I think that's a really key message to everybody that it's it's just be yourself, you know. And actually I finally found the, in the military I could be me, but... You know, I think for years when I first joined, especially when I got to the squadron, I was trying to be more of a boy, more of a bloke, without realising it. Just like, and I'm not bringing the Harriers in, but I've, I've spoken to many different Harrier pilots that said, you know, when they turned up, they were uh, quite quiet, quite shy. And then three years later, they find themselves being, you know, arrogant and loud. And and it was like, and they realised that they morphed. And just as I morphed, when I looked down one day, and we were going on detachment on a VC-10, and we were all wearing civilian clothing which obviously in the RAF world is chinos deck shoes and a blazer and a blue shirt of some description and I looked down and I was wearing that and I thought oh my god I've become a bloke <laughs> and it was really weird and I just thought oh no that's not good that is not good we all we all do sort of blend in but I think you, you pretty much forged a path is people like yourself and Helen and the women at the time uh and and literally changed I don't and you correct me here because I'm going to be a little bit devil's advocate. When I say, well, it probably was sexism, to be honest. I can't really get around it because some of the stuff that was in your book there, I think it probably was a very sexist service back then, wasn't it? And I think, you know, you taking stuff off the wall and going, hey, guys, I've got all the porn for you. You know, that, that stuff is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually didn't put a lot in my book, actually, because my dad read it and he said, I don't think the general public needs to know that uh, fast jet pilots on detachment were watching pornography. You need to take that out of the book. And I went, OK, so I took like huge segments out so it wouldn't offend the general public if they read it, because do you know what? It was it was just the environment. It was it was 20 years ago. The Air Force is not like that anymore. I mean, you're, you've left much more recently to myself, Tim. But when I speak to anyone that's still serving, they say it's a very different place. You know, it's much more diverse. It's much more accepting of lots of different cultures, genders, everything. And brilliant because it had to change. And it has. And that's why I say, actually, you know what? Do I would I recommend it as a career? A hundred percent. It's it's exciting. It's brilliant. It's all of those things that I don't care what gender you are, you know, uh, do it. You know, it's a fantastic role to go into. I think you're absolutely right. I, I must admit there is what am I doing with diversity and inclusion within the service today? I I, I do rally against it because I, I think we're pushing probably too hard, but it's one of those things. And well, it's one of those I, things. I do agree to some degree on the things like, you know, airmen, airwoman, is it just going to be air crew? But do we need to move away from that? You know, but do we need to spend millions of pounds discussing it in a think tank? That's what I would put it down to. I'm there with you. I'm there with you. And I, I was on Twitter the other night. There was a... Um, there was a guy involved in the diversity and in inclusion. He was a black guy. And I wrote to him and said, I really, he followed me. I followed him back. He was in the Air Force and he was very much involved in the DNI week. And I said, look, I just want to say it's not an easy task you've got. I'm, I'm very impressed with what, all the way you guys are handling this. It's, an, it's actually quite a mature way because they're not trying to, they're having breakouts, 
but they're not sitting down and doing a, a week talking. You know what I mean? It's, it's being done reasonably. It was aspects of it. Uh, I'm hearing from a lot of people um, were, were not that. So it, it's, hey, they're learning. So I'm, I'm all right with that. I'm all right. Um, should we talk about flying? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, talk about jets. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you did slide a tornado down uh, Goose Bay's runway sideways whilst saying that you'd like to take uh, PAR, Precision Approach Radar, from the most junior member of air traffic on a talk down when you had no fuel. Would you consider that to be a bad thing and would you do it again? Very bad thing. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a chat, is it? This is an interview. Yeah, no, um, yeah, to be honest, yeah, of course. It, it's really interesting. So you and I both talk about human performance factors. We talk about lots of different things. But one of the areas I talk about is error management, you know, if, especially from talking to businesses sort of in that sort of role. Um, and actually the error management side and threat management is really important. And it's that whole waving that big red flag when you see things starting to go wrong. And many of you out there will have heard of James Reason, Swiss cheese model and all the aligning of the holes. Well, my time in Goose Bay was my moment, my holes in my Swiss cheese to align. Mm. But there were so many opportunities when I could have said stop and I didn't, you know, and it was really interesting because I was chatting to a great friend of mine, Rob Kane, who I believe that you know as well. And he he was the person I was against in that merge. And he said, and you know what's really annoying, Matthew, when I was reading your book, he said, you bloody beat me on that merge again. He said, every time in air combat, you completely whipped my ass. I was like, boom, I forgot that. Um, I should have put that in. Um, but yeah, it was that whole pushing the boundaries, feeling of invincible, uh, inexperienced, uh, making poor decisions. Can I accept a talk down from a trainee? No. I can't. I'm in really thick thunderstorms. I've got minimum fuel and I've got a contaminated, flooded runway. But why didn't I? And it's because of that inexperience and because we always had that can do attitude of, yes, of course I can. But would I do it again? Absolutely not, Tim. Absolutely not. No, and I, I, I use it as an example, Mandy. I know I know you wouldn't. I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, it's a it's almost like an instructor thing. You know, when you when you say to a new you know, student, uh, in fact, I think the tornado Nick F and Dean W ejected from a tornado at Lossy Mouth that did exactly that coming yeah. in. I think that was a mid power, mid mid power thrust reverse selection, which blanked oh, the flow across the tailplane, of course, losing longitudinal stability on a on a wet, contaminated runway with a crosswind. So, you know, yeah. I, I think you went for the handle, didn't you? You just didn't pull it. Well, yeah, Jason, my back seat, a really experienced nav yelled, I'm not ejecting yet. Yeah. I've not even thought about ejecting. You know? <laughs> oh my god! Because I was doing all of the loss of directional control drill, which, and again, that's a really great thing, isn't it? Is you don't just yell, "Oh my god, we're spinning down a runway." You yell, "Loss of control on the ground," and then suddenly you go into the right drill, and that's the whole thing about training, isn't it? You know, you've done it in the sim. Someone says, "Engine fire," you go into engine fire drill, and. It's that whole following of process that can really free up that free capacity. But no, it was funny. I'm not ejecting yet. I, I should have done that to my students when they were doing something stupid, just to see what would happen. You know. But <laughs> uh, it goes to the straight away to the handle. You're thinking, oh my god, yeah. I'm not ejecting then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly <laughs> that. Exactly that. Um, Right, so an interesting comment down here. Actually, I've realised that we are all people pleasers in the military. I'll just show this one up here. All people pleasers in the military, which is a less flattering way. Of saying can do yeah absolutely I, I think that's i think we do that because we're a herd aren't we herd of people man what i'm going to do is i'm going to share the screen and bring up your book because i want to talk about the um i want to talk about some oh, one comment in particular i saw but also i want to talk about the the ratings your book has oh yeah uh, well, feel free <laughs> <what's>, <laughs> let's, have a, let's have a chat shall we i think right here we go uh there we go there I should be sharing a screen with you now we disappear off to the side Yay, you're on the side. Hey, how you doing? And what we have here is a page on Amazon then, and um, an often not a gentleman, the inspiring journey of a pioneering female fighter pilot, a Kindle or paperback edition. Now, you've got 194 five, well, star, 194 reviews, of which they're heavily five star. You don't see that normally. I'm being honest about this. I don't see many books come out. This obviously went to number one, did it, when it was first released? Well, it's still number one. So it's number one in, in aviation category, which I am blown away about. It's been number one now for about quite a long time it dips down occasionally but it pretty much has been there since about mid-june which is unbelievable yeah well i haven't released my book yet so i understand well there was a comment i, I actually looked at i mean who's put a comment on one star so i went because i do that i'm like okay yeah. so let's go and look at the one star i went yeah. down there and it was a dude and he said um this book is all about her no. <laughs> 
No, can I give you the quote? He said, self-indignant. Self what, Frank? Self-indignant, not self-indulgent, which is what he's obviously trying to say, but self-indignant oh. and boring. And I looked up, so I decided to look at him. And basically, as you go down, he's given one star reviews to every single book he's read apart from one. <laughs> I thought, what a miserable life. And you, yeah, you can't stop that, by the way. Um, yeah. There's one guy, when this goes live after this, I, th I think I know who it is. I think I used to fly with him. But, but, but before I do a live stream, and I'm not, guys, just to let you know, we can't watch YouTube at the same time as we're doing this inside the stream because it's to do with bandwidth. So I don't know what's happening on the likes and everything um, at, at the bottom or whether any comments are going down, of course. But there's always one guy, even before the live stream starts, he will click the thumbs down. It, it's... Right. it's how? Why? What do you need? like? Oh, I know what he would have liked. Four minutes late. I mean, I was the to be particularly. Four minutes late. Four minutes late. It could well be that, couldn't it? Um, I'll, I'll take that. I'll suck that one up this time. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's have a look. Right. I've got a card here. Yeah, we both know Rob Kane. Um, I live about, if I was to start walking now, I'd be at Rob's house in about 12 minutes. And oh. the weird thing is, the weird thing about it is, um, he was my boss in one of the squadrons. I worked with him in Bristol and he became a boss uh, on four when I was part-time flying up there, which you should never do, by the way, on fast jets. But he he came over to me when I was in Bristol and he said, Tim, Tim, come look at this house I'm about to buy. And I was literally about to buy a house as well. Like we, the next week we were just doing the final viewing and that was it. Uh, and he zoomed in the map, zoomed in, zoomed in, in between uh, sort of Gloucester and Hereford. I get death threats sometimes, so I can't zone into the exact okay. place but in that part of the country. And he kept zooming in. I'm like, and he, he stopped and I'm like, that's really weird. He's showing me my house, like literally. And it, and it was literally down a couple of bends in the road. And, and I'm like, I've got a chance to pull out of this, haven't I? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, do you know what? He was going to be staying here, actually, at my house tomorrow night, but we've had to pull out because of Corona. Um, but he's going down to speak to someone quite close to me at Lark Hill. So he's like, oh, Mandy, can we meet up? Which would be really lovely. Yeah. He got picked up, didn't he, I think? He's, um, he's is he a group captain? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah, I had a long, long chat with him last week. He's on yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy, Rob. His, his head's always in the right place. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I do banter him, obviously, mercilessly, mercilessly. Um, I'll tell you what, people are going to find it really interesting, aren't they? They're like, he's going to he's going to write to me. You were talking about me on my on your podcast. Yeah, that's why you have a podcast. So, you know, that's it. Yeah. That's leverage right there, isn't it? Um, right. Yeah, one of the things I would say, um, when I message you, this is a trait of pilots, and you demonstrate this really well in our messaging prior to this chat, Whenever I send you an email, if it didn't require a response, you never gave me one. If I send you a WhatsApp, if it didn't require a response, if it didn't require anything, like it wasn't a question, it was a confirmation, nothing would come back from you. And I like that. And I miss that in civilian world because I can write something going, yeah, it's all confirmed, right, tidy it up, be on air at 1850 and we'll go. And people write back going, yeah, okay, I will. Thanks so much. And it's just this, this chat that's unnecessary, isn't it? But you're not like that. You're very direct and to the point. Bizarrely, I was at the hairdressers today, actually, when we were talking exactly about this, because there's this great profiling tool called Insights, and we've done it, and I was talking to my hairdresser about it, we said, I learned about this, because when someone sends me an email, and I, and I actually showed her, I got this really long email, I was like, look at the length of this email, and so I just said, and there's one response to it, yes, and I literally wrote yes back, and then I thought, oh God, it's someone that speaks a lot, so I'm going to have to like, pop and tail it with, hi, lovely to hear from you, da 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 da, -da. yes, Da, 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 da. And I actually have to do that all the time because I am really, really um, precise. And I just think I don't want to waste time with lots of chit chat. So I, people send me really long tweets on uh, direct messenger and stuff. And, and I just go, great idea. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to. You haven't got time. In the, people don't seem to realise. I mean, you're very much in the public speaking space. You're very much in the best selling author space. And thank you for coming on, obviously. But you don't have the time in your life to be some of the emails I get. And I can't show you them, obviously, because it'll be a young chap on there and stuff. And I, I say even next to the email, the web form on my website, it says, look, business use only, guys, you know, business use. Contact me on one of these social media things. Go on to Facebook, whatever, and find me if you want to have a chat about something. But this is business. I get I get a web form from you know Dan age 14 or something about how to and it's it's a lot people write me a lot you know it's, it's yeah. an essay and I get so many of them I can't which is why I say go to Patreon if you go to Patreon I do a webinar every month yeah. you can sit, you can do this with me literally live for, for yeah. an hour and a half and we'll sit there and answer everything for you it's it, and they you get other people helping you out you know you get other pilots come on there if you go into the advance you get one-on-one -on -one with me you know I can and, and you don't want to be one-on-one -on -one with me in a power coaching hour because it's expensive because of what exactly it is but it's a very uh, you know inexpensive way of actually getting um some some real value yeah but yeah you know I mean, I've been doing, I've been speaking to a lot of uh, university air squadrons and air training corps, and this is, you know what, let's look at the positives in 
of COVID, it has created a more acceptable forum to be able to speak to people by doing this, isn't it? So actually by saying, you know, I can't go to air training core after air training core and speak to all these individual units. But I tell you what, get a wing together on Zoom and I'll speak to hundreds of you in one go. And then, you know what, you can text me or come up with any messages or questions afterwards. And it's been really great forum for doing that. I've done loads of the different wings now. I've spoken to, you know, two or three of the university air squadrons. I've got a few more programmed in the diary to do. And it's just a great way of actually being able to do that, but without all the travel. Because I just was getting, I'm quite busy normally. I can't do that travel just to speak to 15 children. But I can sit in my home and do it to a lot of bigger audience and to a global audience, which is great. You know, speaking to schools in Australia um, and and Canada in the same day. How exciting is that? Oh, it's, it's amazing. I, I do the same thing. I got contacted by hampshire wing or i don't know i don't know what it is but i said look make sure you get enough you know, join with southampton or something and make sure you get enough in there because I, I haven't got the time to do it twice well, best uh, place to live in the world what can i say hampshire well yes well <laughs> portsmouth is where i was and that's my oh, family no. oh no wrong side sorry <laughs> uh, we're not going across the southampton that's for sure um <laughs> right andrew says i'll put it up here because um this is it <laughs> Your beard is looking on point, Tim. Grace, facial topog. Yes, man bomb. I was on a podcast with a guy called Chris Dangerfield. Um, I like Chris a lot. I don't know whether you go on other people's podcasts, man. Obviously, you don't. You only come on mine. Fine. Oh, I like that. <laughs> of course. Um, Chris Dangerfield was like the opposite of what of what you and I are. This guy oh. had been on a huge amount of drugs. He's in Cambodia, I believe. But I got on with him. Like a, yeah. He's a great guy. Like and he's got this yeah. What's that? Was that because you both had beards? Yeah. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's a good-looking man, not as good-looking as I am. So, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, right. Okay, let's get back into this then. Okay, let's get back into this because there was something I wanted you to talk about. Um, let's. When you first came off the squadron, in fact, no, you were on 15 at the time when the first fatality happened, of course, with the guys on the QI range trying to get in up on the northeast coast, wasn't it? Um, yeah. You had a fatality there. That was the first time I experienced that. It goes in threes. There was the station commander of the Jaguar that dropped it on final ended up above the Nimrod as they're looking for him in the sea. Yeah. I mean, that was all the same week. And then Stevie Todd. Yeah. Uh, and, just, um, oh yeah. God. Uh, yeah. That was Shap, wasn't it? And the Hawk. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if any of you, you know, out there have actually ever sort of been in such close proximity to, to young people losing their lives like that. And it is so traumatic to lose people at the top of their game, you know, and when we were at Lossy Mouth, it was, it was probably a day that I, it, it literally I can get, I've got goosebumps now when I think about it. And I think that's right that you do, because it means that it, it was, it's lodged in your brain and in your emotions. And I even helped them plan the mission. You know, I was photocopying for them when they left. You know, it's almost like we were the junior Joes. They're going off on their QY mission and we helped photocopy the maps for them. And then they left and then they never came back. And But seeing the devastation of what that did to the course, because the, the, the QI course, the Qualified Weapon Instructors course, they are at the top of their game. At, and um, they are a tight bunch, only eight of them. And to lose two of that course, it, it decimated them. So actually having that mindset to get back out there on the Monday and pick up the course, that took courage as well. You know, it really did. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a very dark, dark week that week. Yeah. I do talk about it because I say one of the things as a pilot in the service is that you you do get people who are better pilots than you die and you have to go into work and do that, do the flying again. And I think there's an impact. I think there is um, something you carry with you. I mean, I've had, obviously, I, I don't know how, I, fatalities, I think it was like 37 when I was in my 20-year career, people I knew, you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, you, you still go in, you think, well, hang on a second if that guy died and he was a better pilot than me mm. and you carry that with you. And I think that's, that's that baggage you build up. And I think when you leave the service, you kind of need to sort of do some work on that and just to yeah. undo a bit of that baggage and get a bit more compassionate with your own self. I, th I think so. And if you think, so I think it was a couple of years ago now, and there were four former fast jet pilots all committed suicide, mm. you know, all either late forties or fifties. And it was almost like, went ding 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 and you just look you think you know why did that happen and and where is the help for these people once you leave the services and that's something that actually i i think that we are lacking in a little bit is the support after leaving that you then fall off the radar 
And actually, we really need to look after the help with regards to PTSD or, you know, even just things that you've witnessed, you know, um, and it doesn't mean that you had to have been, say, in Afghanistan or shot at or anything, but just, you know, you go from this community to nothing. And I think people really struggle with it. Yeah, it's hard. I run a spin, I, I run a course called the Spin Recovery Course. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't take any military on there unless they've been out of the service for longer than a year. There's a reason for that because they need to do that work and then they need to realize or they need to understand that they maybe haven't, then they come back on the course. But I mean, it has helped a lot of people and, and it does cost because it's my time, but you're in a group of six men. And I only run it for men, Mandy, because we, we found mixing groups doesn't really work. So the individual coaching clients I have are men and women, but I only do the course um, with men. It, it just works like that. But it's a it's a great course um and it, it seems to really help people out uh, i've got guys lined up again for, for another one now but people are finding it financially difficult so i'm trying to work a way of making it more affordable um without losing the value of the of the course as it as it were i do a lot of work with with men uh, and this when i came out of the service i wrote about mental health issues back in 2011 in an essay where i said um and it was a bit clickbaity um i can't remember the title of it now someone will probably drop it in the chat but it was when good pilots go bad there you go oh i got hate for that yeah. yeah, yeah, good policy. Yeah, and it was about me being in the office, uh, just not working. The whole head was in a spin. I just come off a service inquiry into John Egan. Wow. Um, my, fa my father had died. Sean was killed in the Reds, of course. Real yeah. turbulent time, and the squadron was failing. And we'd had a close aboard near fatality uh, with an Australian QFI who, luckily, probably saved. He was on. He was just visiting the squadron, and he, and he really set us straight and said, "Guys, this is what you're doing is not safe." And he wow. was right, of course. Wow. So I managed to get some psychologists involved from RAFCAM. We shut the squadron down back in 2014. It allowed me six months to get my instructors, but it wow. took my instructors trained. But it, you know what, Mandy? It took a lot. It took a lot. I carried on being angry. I eventually left the service and I realized I was still angry. I still see a therapist now every three months, every three months or so. That's good. I see a dude. Yeah. And I do some work and I unpack that. And, you know, come out of service, failing marriage, pretty classic. I just put the failing aviator video up the other day. I don't know if you saw that. Um, do you remember, do you remember that video? No, no, I saw that one. The Failing Aviator is a guy called Lanny Gieb who gives a presentation. Uh, it was quite a classic. I think you probably did see it when you went through one of the RAFCAM courses because he did right. it in the early 90s. Oh, okay. in America, um, it's up there. I'll send you a link later. But he he talks about who we are. Um, you know, we're, we're very predictable. We're uh, mission-orientated compartmentalizers who characterize their male distance by – sorry, male-female interface by, by physical – by distance, basically. Um, and we're very – you know, we are all the same people, aren't we? But yeah. – I kind of showed that to my wife and that didn't work out well. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought it'd be interesting to understand that, but she realized that I was probably never going to change. And I was, now we're better. Don't get me wrong, but coming out of the service was a, was a very difficult time, I think. And this is why I now go so much into mental health, especially seeing, as you said, you know, the, that, that, those four pilots, just one, two, three, four, wasn't it? It was incredible. It was, and I went to two of their funerals. You know, I'm just seeing Alan. Alan, you know, my heart goes out to you there. You've lost one of your own. And it's just so sad. And, and you know, it behoves us. We we need to do something there. And I think it is, there are charities out there, but when people are in that, that mental state, uh, uh, their mental health state is not good, they don't want to reach out to a charity. So it's it's, that's the difficulty, is how do you reach the right people, you know, um, and I think a lot of it goes down to purpose, you know, finding that sense of purpose. The spin recovery actually stands for self-esteem. Purpose is the second letter in spin. And then identity. And the last one is negativity. And of course, self-esteem is exceptionally important for, you know, self-esteem has to be it just so happens that, that these words fit in. I didn't make them up. But purpose, yeah. what is especially what is a man's purpose? Women, uh, I'm interested in your opinion here, Mandy, but I think women with children seem to, if they have children, seem to have a real purpose there and it just seems to be that men seem to have some kind of go and hunt the dragon and, and go and find yeah. it and what legacy am I going to leave yeah. uh, then it's about identity it's about negativity but this is what we cover in the, in the course you know we break it down so uh, I think let's talk about what happened during COVID then in those lockdown that early lockdown period um, so for myself career was off the scale I was traveling all over the world doing speaking I was at the top of my profession I was loving it, absolutely loving it. I mean, I'm as I'm a, a, a far extrovert as you can get. So going into a room full of strangers, love it. Talk to everyone, it's fantastic. And suddenly it went to nothing. And I had lost my purpose. I also had COVID. I was feeling a little bit low. Um, and everyone was contacting me going, are you happy to do a motivational speech? I was thinking, no, I'm just motivating myself. I'm feeling a bit shit. And anyway, 
I saw a thing that went out on Facebook, uh, just a local group, and it just said, um, looking for volunteers at the hospital. So I got in touch and I said, hey, you're looking for volunteers. They said, we are. Now, I live with two teenage boys and my husband, so three men in my house, a lot of laundry. And I said, where can I help in the hospital? And they said, in the laundry. I was like, you are bloody joking of all the places that I want to work. It's in the laundry. So I ended up for three months, basically, laundering scrubs. I was literally loading a washing machine, taking them out to the tumble dryer and then folding them up. And on my very first day at work, it was hilarious. I did my job. I was so proud. And I went down to look where my um, ID card was. And I thought, oh, my God, I've lost it. On the first day, I've lost my ID card. And I'm thinking, where the hell could it be? And then I just turned and in the tumble dryer stuck on front of the door was my slightly melted id card i was like first fail yes i have melted my id card in this tumble dryer you know but it gave me purpose you know what in the that's what i needed so i did that and i and i did it and my husband's still doing it now you know into the lord and it's a really good leveler because it makes you realize we're all cogs in that machine to take you back to the RAF and the military analogy we all need a place. We all need our team members. And actually, the weakest point in the hospital at the time was the fact that they said we needed scrubs and there was no way of getting them through to the front line. So there you go. Um, yeah, I was in Davy land, Mr. Wargraves. That's, so, um, that, that is brilliant. I do, yeah, it is that for Mandy, said the Davy land. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. So um, I've got some pictures I want to just go through. Uh, they're all found obviously on your either your profile your website's fantastic by the way i would say if people are working in companies at the moment i do give a message about work in a minute because a lot of people a lot of people losing their jobs so when when we eventually end mandy you know i'll, I'll just do a quick 30 seconds and, and i'll come back to you but um uh i would say if you're in a company you do want some motivational speaking and i've seen mandy speak and she's fantastic i'm going to share a screen mandy we're going to go through some pictures of you and this is when you were very small because you went to is it is it emuas is that east midlands <laughs> I went oh, to it, it, the Blue Lions. Ubas. Ubas. What's that then? U University of Birmingham Air Squadron. East Midlands was oh. Nottingham and Loughborough. We were the, the mighty Central England. So, yeah, we recruited from Aston Coventry all the way up to where was it? Lugsy came from. Oh, uh, crew. Lugsy <laughs> came from crew, did he? Mighty University crew in Alsatia. <laughs> Sorry, My goodness. I didn't. I didn't care. I was an OTC guy. I had no time for the air squad. And then I joined the navy. Yeah. Didn't I stay? Yeah. Well, Whatever. But... Finger in all pies. <laughs> yeah, too many. Right. I'm going to show you pictures of you when you were a small baby um, fighter pilot, and then we're going to talk. We're going to. We're going to laugh. It's going to be. It's going to be brilliant. You're going to love it. Right. In the in the comments, please, can you say, "Oh, Mandy's got a lot more attractive with age." Please. First well, I was going to say. Up, thumbs up. I was going to say how wonderful your hair looked after after today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Got to say it, I'm like, but you never got out of the crew room, did you? Right, here we go. Oh, yeah, that was my last time flight on the tornado. That is one it, is that, yeah, you never flew again, did you? You never went back after no, first... that was my last day flying with Ringo. Yeah, I got handed a you know, and there's and there's someone in that that's no longer with us, Slagman, is oh, the right. yeah. So, um, but no, that was an amazing day. You, you do talk about it quite well. And you also talk about why you didn't go back to the big jet um, for yeah. family reasons and why you didn't go to Valley. I spent 10 years at Valley, by the way. I'm not saying that you were you were wrong to do that. I think it's very sensible to go to Boscombe. Boscombe's a great place, isn't it? It's a lovely place. It's, it is great. It is great. So, um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I, I, I think this is a really important point because a lot of people say, how do you get that work-life balance? And especially because I speak at a lot of diversity events and things like that. And I say, you know, there's no utopia. I will say this, there is no utopia. I'd had two children um, on a ground tour at High Wycombe and basically I was told, um, you know, if I didn't go back to the front line or to Valley, then I would never be promoted. And, and, and let's be honest, that's what I was told. And that was the truth. That was the situation. I didn't put the name of the person that had told me that, by the way, because let's just say he's as high ranking as you can now get in the Air Force. But we don't need to mention names. Um but he was my posting officer and he told me that. And I and I took it as as fact because why would I challenge the system then? Because I'm just a flight lieutenant in the system. And I just assumed that that to be the case. So I had to weigh that up my odds. And I've got this amazing job lined up at Boscombe Down whereby I could be a mum and I could work for the Air Force still. And I feel in some ways I did give up on my career, but I kept a job. And that's the way it felt for a few years. 
That's what John Boyd said, isn't it? He said you can be someone or you can do something. And a lot of senior officers, of course, decided to um, be someone, didn't they? It's fine. Yeah. It is what yeah. it is. Um, but you're right. I do say that to a lot of people as well. I say you can't, you can't have it all. You've got to at some point sacrifice something. As, as and, and women, uh, one of the big issues. I think I, uh, I'm not. You know, I do talk about women because I did train a lot of women, of course. And I, my family is entirely women, apart from my brother and um, uh, my six year old nephew. The rest of my family, my mum, my two sisters. Um, she has three girls, so I'm, I'm around women the whole time. And your wife, you know, I think, is one. What's that? And even your wife is one, I believe. Well, sometimes she's a bit of a tiger, to be honest. Ooh, uh, we don't need to go into that. Let's keep it clean, please. Okay, keep it clean. Come on, family show. Right. So moving on then. Thank you. This is you doing amazing things and uh, talking about how awesome tornado pilots are, which I must admit, I just clap, I clapped her out like this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you came actually. I was suffering from, um, wasn't I suffering from labyrinthitis and I nearly fell off the stage? Yeah, you <laughs> did. You did, yeah, but it's, it was it was still really good though. No one, no one knew. No one, they don't, do they? They look at the, they see up there. They're like, whoa! I'm like, it's Mandy, it's Mandy. What are you doing? Yeah, exactly. What are you doing? It's Mandy, right? Um, Craig. Yeah, my lovely husband, best man in the world. I have to say, I mean, he really is a superstar. Um, yeah, I I flew with him. I, I was a naval officer, obviously, and I flew. I held down post Tucanos. I held down uh, on at Cold Rose, and I think I flew them down there several times in the back seat. You know, jumping around. He was very much a gentleman. Um, yeah. Still flying, is he? He is. In fact, he's been in the simulator today. He's not airborne anymore, so he left the navy in two thousand. Uh, worked for different airlines. Ended up with EasyJet. Uh, gave that up. I think it's two years ago now, and is a type rating instructor and examiner. Um, pretty much the top of this field as far as you can get and yeah. he now does all the simulators so he's been giving Icelandic pilots their licenses today up at Gatwick so he's okay. just got home um, yeah and I've obviously just thrown the tea on the table before I came up here and obviously he's watching your live stream thinking wow oh, this is yeah. amazing. you can't get enough you can't get enough <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. now you went to shiny two didn't you Marin? which is obviously why we don't get on because I was a lossy man and there's only one place to fly tornadoes in the UK, and that is Lossy Mouth, and you know this because you don't have any uh, hills even down at Marham. And what's yeah. this jet? So this is a low-level swing-wing mission of death, and yet you're just flying in a straight line. I flew a jet down to Marham once to deliver it, and then I got out of there as quick as possible because it's very yeah. remote. But I literally, my nav and I, we're, we're sat down there flying low-level over the fence, and we're like, I don't have to do anything here. I can literally trim this out. It's so really it is so boring. Oh, yes, the Harrowwood. Absolutely, Andrew. Um, so basically, well, Shiny 2. It's called Shiny 2 for a really good reason, though, because everyone on 2 Squadron gets promoted to a really high level. And you're probably going, oh, yeah, yeah. So the former chief of the air staff was Sir Steve Hillier. He was my boss. His deputy was Mike Wigston, who's the current chief of the air staff. And his deputy, or OCD flight at the time, was a guy called Windy Gale, who is ACAS at the moment. So. Okay. You know what? You've got to go, yeah, there's quite a lot of high-ranking officers. And then and then there's me. Bugger. What happened? Oh, Dan. I ended up serving with Dan, absolutely, at, at Handling Squadron. He and I literally, I think we got our um, twin um, twin rating together um, by doing lots of flying. It was a little secret. But, Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I, I do... Um... I do talk with that with Ian Gale on um, ACAS on on Twitter quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I do like I like him. He flies privately actually, but yeah, yeah he's a top I, he is a lovely guy. You got to keep these seniors in check though. I know Mike Wigston, he was my boss on twelve. He brought me across from the Navy, in fact, to the Air Force. So oh. I, I had an email from him a few weeks ago, in fact, um, because of the other work I'm doing. But uh, you, you need to keep these top guys in in check most definitely. Right, where are we now? We're well, that one, aren't we? There we are. This is you hugging a tornado, obviously. Yeah, this Oxford. I did a um oh I just did a, a, a interview with the company and they actually took some really good photos. In fact, the photo bizarrely that's on the front of the book. And um I, I, so I, was, I was going through them afterwards when I was trying to come at the cover of my uh, book and I thought, oh my god, that's brilliant. So I contacted the magazine and I said, Can I use that photo <laughs> of the, me standing outside a outside a hanger? And he said, Yeah, absolutely. I was like, winner. So I didn't even have to do another photo shoot for my book, but yeah, a bit short. There. that's ideal actually i must admit this is this is to people to get an idea of how big this aircraft actually was i know there's a bit of perspective in here as well but yeah. she she really was a, a big this is people don't seem to realize this but the tornado gr 4 was something that when david cameron was in power whenever something kicked off overseas he would he would say where are my tornadoes 
that's he would just say, "Where are my tornadoes?" And normally, like they're scattered all over the world. To be fair, you know what I mean, yeah. all over the place. But um, he would say, "Right," because all he wants to do is drop a squadron of tornadoes in country. Um, which, yeah. yeah, most definitely do that. Enough but bombs hanging off the bottom. The thing uh, with the tornado is, it looks like what it does. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a warmongering machine, and and that's what it did, and it did the job brilliantly for years and years. I mean, how long was it in on frontline service? Is it thirty? 89, oh. I think, was its first one. So, yeah, from 1990, pretty much, through to 2020. So 30 years of frontline um, flying. I flew it in a video game just on just to try it out. And I got airborne. I was behind the jet. I was like, whoa, this is gear travels, flap travels. I you know, tried to get all the checks done. Where's the mask? Where's the... Yeah, I went down the Great Glen. I was like, guys, you don't realize this is on virtual reality. I was like, this is – I had, the, had real weather at Lossy as well. So all the clouds were low. You know, you can't see the top of the, the glens. And I was like – this, this feels like I don't want to fly this anymore. This is, this is getting back into flying. I don't want to do that. Um, here we are. I think it's the last one, actually. The, now, oh. I looked at this. I went, I thought I thought her name was Mandy. <laughs> Amanda, thank you very much. Let's Amanda, that. I know, I know. Can we pull up um, Polsky's comment? I think it's a really good comment just to comment about. Second let me point. just, let me do that. Hold on a second. Where am I looking? How far up? Oh, Polsky here. Okay, yeah. And this is what I want you to do now, Mandy, because we're going into this Q&A yeah. stuff here so we can do this. I wonder why there was a woman in the military getting... F okay, let's do this properly. I wonder why, when there was a mil woman in the military getting filmed, they need to add that one detail to the title and form us. Yeah, no, valid. What do you want to say about that? I, I think that's valid. It's, it's I think it's a really good point, and it's one of the reasons why. So when I do my speaking, people say, oh, you know, are you, can you come and speak at a diversity event, or can you come and speak to this women's group, or, you know, and I say, okay, I do mention that I was a woman in the Air Force, in case that is not obvious, but that is not what the speech is about. The speech is about being a fast jet pilot on the front line. And after the first word, when basically I do show a photo of myself, Joe Salter and Kirsty Murphy. And I say, you know, we were finally at this do. And there was literally the three of us there and 400 men. I was like, happy days, because I've been married for a long time, you know. And um, we put this photo out on social media and I sort of share that story. But after that, I don't mention it again, because it's not about being a woman in that world. And now I didn't want my book to go down that sexist rant way. And I really pray it didn't come across that way. It, I want it to be an honest depiction of what happened. But, you know, I do not want anyone to think that I would change anything about how it was when we went through. Because it, it's not about being a woman pilot. It's about being a pilot. So what is the point, Polsky? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Fight the power. Um, I also say that it's about being an officer first and a pilot second. A lot of people don't realise that. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I get a lot of emails going, I want to be a pilot. Yeah, crack on with that because you're not going to get through IoT for a start. I, I really like the way you wrote up about initial officer training and getting through it. And, the, 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 you know, you you, you realise you had two uh, ex-rankers on there, I think, that said, we're going to teach you how to do this. Oh, yeah. And and they yeah. did. Just like, literally on day one, they were like, guys, it's the team is everything. You know, and you're like, really? I'm not sure because I come from university and I'm like all like, I know all my stuff. And you're like, yeah. After day two, you're like, yeah, it's all about the team. We completely get it, you know, as you're being beasted. And you're just going, oh, my God, really? But, I mean, one of the best um, quotes I keep on getting, which people keep on quoting about from the book, is literally first sort of like the first chopping opportunity uh, I was hauled in for not being female enough. And uh, he said to me, and I, I don't know if you probably remember this in the book, um, mm. he said to me, um, yeah, you, uh, you, you know, I was told that you weren't allowed to drink pints. As a female going through office training, you were not allowed to drink pints because it was not feminine enough. And so when he hauled me in and told me I was Amazonian in nature, but not feminine enough, I said, why, sir, <laughs> when I'm drinking, you know, drinking beers in the bar? And he said, yes, but you do insist on buying two half pints. And I was like, Obviously, I'm not going to buy a round for 10 blokes and then one half for myself. So I always had made a statement, two halves in front of me. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that is annoying. That um, is brilliant. Yeah, I'll have these two big hands. There we go. Yeah. Brilliant. Right. So what we're going to do, we're going to go back up top then. We're going to flick through these of you, all right? I mean, what have we covered? So uh, let me have a look. I don't want to read any more of your book. Yeah, we we, we talked about Rob, haven't we? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, we have. Oh, the funny thing is, though, I, I must admit, I look back on this. I speak to a lot of people still because I'm, I'm involved in aviation through a company called Aerolist, which are, are looking to bring bring modularity, so the airline type mode into flying training. We're in a funding round, so I, I get to meet loads of people, I get to meet very senior Air Force guys now and chat to them, which is fantastic, of course. Um, yeah. I always say to them, or they always say to me as well, it's a massive discussion. It's like I think we probably lived through the golden age of of kind of you know, jet flying, to be honest, where the technology had reached a point where we're still in control of it uh but it's still really great 
Like, do you remember flying the tornado? It was such a loud cockpit, wasn't it? All the RWR and yeah, it was brilliant. It felt like you. It's it's raw. It's real. Yeah. It, it's flying, and you think actually. To get him to say the F-35, I loved it when I was watching the program and they said, it's broken. They went, oh, just try turning it on and off again. I was like, oh, my God, we've got this jet on the whole line. And they're going, control, delete, you know. But it, it's silent and it's just almost like, has that raw flying gone? We had enough technology to make it, make it a pleasure to fly, but not so much that it didn't feel like you were flying, almost like flying a computer game. Well, I, I, when I flew this little sim, of course, I forgot to put the wings back. Like, you know, I didn't have a nav to go wings, did I? Or, or maneuvers. Yeah, <laughs> wings. <laughs> maneuvers. It's all right. Shut up. I've got it. I've got it. I meant to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, answer Gar Graham's first question. Uh, okay. Did Andy ever take a tornado to Gibraltar in the last 10 years? No, I did not. Sorry, Graham, to answer that question. Um, You're going through them at a different rate to me because we're both doing this. Let's, let's start at the top, shall we? And we'll come down and see whether we're we hitting capitals. I think we're hitting capitals, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, you didn't take a Gibraltar. No, okay, Gibble Tarek, Gibraltar. No, no, um, um but um, no. Uh, my husband had lots of good stories about flying into Gibraltar. Have you ever flown into Gibraltar, Tim? Yeah, what was he in? I think I was in a hawk actually. Yeah. No, no. Was I in a hawk? I can't remember now. Flying yeah. in there, yeah. The runways that they've got to see it then, isn't it? And there's a yeah. road across the middle. Yeah, the wind shear as well as you're going yeah. in. He's one in the one of the most top ten dangerous airfields to land in in, in the world. It's easy. Easy, apart from the rock. And the <laughs> apart from the big rock. <laughs> apart from the big rock. Yeah. Uh, right. So I'm still scrolling down. Still scrolling down. People aren't asking you any questions because maybe because you're answering them all. Oh yeah, because I'm going through. I'm being really lovely. There's a lot of chat, and actually, you know, I'm really pleased. So there's lots of chat. Sarah is a real. So Sarah Furness is um, was helicopters, and in fact, still is. So squadron leader. Uh, real believer in mental health and well-being. She's doing loads in that space at the moment. And I think you're right, Sarah, you've written there. Uh, we can proactively arm our people with the tools to take on these challenges rather than wait till they're broken. And I think, is the Air Force getting better at doing that, do you think? Uh, I don't know now. I mean, how would you, what would you think? I mean, I, I don't think it used to be. But I, I, I would hope it's getting better. Did I? I mean, I heard, for example, I mean, when I went through Valley, it was eat glass, if you fail, you're out, sort of feel to it. But that's changed a lot. So certainly when I was talking to Rob um, Kane about this, you know, sort of saying, actually, why do we want to break somebody when they've yeah. got this far? It's more about encouraging. Yes, you want to say there's not a safety issue, but we don't want to break people when there's no point in breaking them. No. Now, I, I the other day I put something out there about I get sent stuff all the time, and I'm really careful about what I put out because it's going to damage someone's career. So I have to you know, be careful, but someone had put something in a signature block about, it was a bit, it was, a you know, when, when pilots, you know, how pilots are, they're trying to push buttons. They're probably looking for a bit of a fight sometimes just because that's who we are. We're a bit confrontational, aren't we? It's one of our, you know, makeup. And he put something in signature block saying uh, something like the role of the, the Royal Air Force is to fly and fight. Uh, the role of those who don't is to support those who do, which is a bit kind of alpha -y, typhoon -y fighter pilot. Yeah. yeah. I spoke to the dude and he was like, yeah, it was in there. You know, I guess I didn't really think too much about it, but whatever. Anyway, someone flashed up about it, put form out. Now, you need your fighter pilots to be fighters. So this is how I look at it. You need them to be fighters. But you're right. In training, it's still a nurturing environment. But yeah. the, the funny thing that I that hit me a lot with students as they came to Valley is when they realized when we started the weapons phase, remember, that's the first time they've ever, ever done weapons. They've gone through, well, now they go through the Grob Prefect at EFT. They go through the T6 at BFT. Then they go through 25 Squadron on the Hawk T2, which is purely uh, what would be 208 Squadron that you and I did, Mandy. Yeah. And then you went to 74, of course, but 74, I went to 19, same thing, is now 4 Squadron. Um, 4 Squadron is a weapon squadron. When they first start on that, sometimes it's a bit of a, oh, now I've got a, I've got, oh, I'm actually a weapon system, am I? I didn't realise. I thought, you know, it hits them. Yeah. I think maybe that's where we kind of, and I used to say to some people, I'm like, yeah, this isn't a flying club anymore, guys. You're going to be sent places you don't want to go and into wars you don't want to agree with. Yeah. I'm very worried. I say very worried because I'm, I get feedback from the instructors now at different levels. In fact, I was chatting to an instructor earlier from the prefect before this call very briefly. And um, some some students are being fed some things in university that aren't really conducive to, to that kind of war fighting mentality. And I, I worry that the service needs to grab these people and readjust early. And that's not telling them they've got to eat glass, but it is telling them that it isn't 
if someone said to you, I mean, we knew back then that people were going to die, didn't we? We knew because people were, and you know, we had these issues. Uh, it was a bigger air force back then. There were a lot of different squadrons. Germany was still active at the time, wasn't it? You could have gone yeah. to Germany. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. It's very small now because there's not many squadrons going on. Um, when I was there, there were seven. Act, there were seven uh, strike squadrons on the on the tornado, and of course, fifteen. You probably had more than seven. I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, there is that in in that mix of being what I would say, you know, being a warrior in effect, because you are going to war and you are doing warrior like things. There's other people you can sort of lean on and you can talk to. I just worry it's getting a bit isolated for the individual now, and we're expecting a lot more of them. Uh, and I, I'm just, I think it needs to be a very steady hand. The people that write to me, the young people that write to me. I can tell who's not going to either get in or is not going to be sustainable within the service pretty early on. And yeah, I mean, you even see that if I if I'm working, say, with the Air Experience flight and I'm say then flying with UAS cadets, I see the cadets straight away that have got those officer qualities. I, I can see it even in my son's friends when I meet them. I think you would make an excellent officer. I say excellent officer because I do think that that's the important thing. You would make an excellent officer, and I think. So long as you have got things like the situational awareness, the decision making, you know, there is mental toughness to it. And it is, and that's why I talk about that grit and resilience being so important. You can't gift someone that lessons learned through building your resilience through failure, you know. Um, but I think Dan's got a good point. And, and Dan Denham just, he and I talked about this a lot when we were at Handling Squadron, that actually we did see some really, really excellent people getting chopped because it was almost like a, we're going to break you. I mean, one of my really good friends, Matt Lindley, was an excellent pilot and has proved himself to be a very capable aviator on the Royal Squadron and as a 747 pilot. And yet it was almost like they wanted to break him. And it was mm. was it was genuinely a waste. So I do agree with Dan. And I think um, I was really lucky that, and I talk about this in my book, there was a guy called Ray Locke and he was the chief instructor at the time. He was an A1QFI. He was a brilliant guy. And I see him at all the reunions and I say to him, I owe you my career I believe uh, because basically I went up for what would have potentially been my chop ride and rather than breaking me he didn't he actually enabled me to do well and I said why did you why did you I didn't, I didn't say why did you make it easy I said why did you not break me and he said because you've been doing brilliantly until now and all I can see is your scores going down and that says to me loss of confidence and you are in this complete spiral of loss of confidence and actually, if you can just pass, you'll be fine. And guess what? I got onto 74 Squadron, which was the other side of the road, uh, and I didn't have any problems. You know, I had no problems at all on 74, but he could have broken me right at the end of 208 Squadron, which would have been, you know, a real loss, I think. Yeah, I'm absolutely right. We saw it time and time again. When, when we knew a student was on the buffet, which what well, you and I know what that means, of course, but very close to failure, uh, a real struggling student, maybe on RA3, so immediate action report three. So they, they failed once, they failed again. And this is really is a chop ride. And I flew a lot of chop rides with a lot of people. And I uh, unfortunately had to remove a lot of them from the fast jet stream, but only after a significant amount of work. So if you move someone from a fast jet stream and they've come that far, yeah. they will probably end up on rotary and multi engine or RPAS, Reaper, you know, remote pilot air systems. But there is no guarantee they will. So there's a lot of um, work that, that that's, that's done to remove someone. But I, Realized, and all my instructors realized uh, on C flight, CFS flight, that a lot of it is that built up stress and pressure that goes in over time. So yeah. we used to say to the student, look, to be honest, I'll be fair with you. Uh, we've looked at all the paperwork here. There's every chance you're not going to pass this trip. OK, so I want you to really enjoy this trip. Literally think about the fact that you're probably not going to pass it and you probably failed it already. By the way, I'd say to them back in the office, I've got everything wrapped out, ready for you. When we come, we're both going to the office, we sit there. I've already phoned up the multi-engine school. I've already phoned up the rotary school. There are slots there. Um, you're ready to go. We can have you on another course within about four weeks. Go and chill out with the family. We'll start flying training again. So let's go and enjoy this today. You know, let's 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 find a really easy target over here just because targeting is really fun. Let's go and do some sap work and let's just get out there and have a laugh. And you'd find their flying was it, it was like 200 percent better. Yeah. Like take the stress off. And they'd yeah, they'd come back out and they they would love it and they'd be like. I'm so glad to have done Jets. Brilliant. I'm happy now. I love it. I'm, thanks to him. Let's, oh, I'd love to come and <laughs> I passed them, of course, because it was a great trip. Yeah, but they'd be like, wrong, mate. You're not getting Yeah, yeah. They'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think, I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. And, um, you know, when we're talking, when I do a lot of my um, corporate sessions, I talk a lot about the stress bucket and that layers of stress. And I think 
when we think about it at the moment, we're seeing this you know, this cumulative buildup of stress because of what's going on with COVID, particularly with our youngsters, actually, you know, my the son's age, you know, 15 year old in school, not knowing if he's going to do his exams, what's happening, hasn't been in school for six months, you know, you know, at state school, we didn't have Zoom lessons going on, you know, and he's like, what's the point, you know, and, and there's this cumulative buildup of stress. And I think it's about, as you found, finding a tap to release that stress. And I think that's really important, which is brilliant. Um, which is fantastic, you know, it is fantastic. But um, there's quite a few questions coming in, actually, Tim, about escape and evasion. I'm, they're not all from War Graves. Um, but did you do escape and evasion survival? There's an entire chapter in my book. You know what? You should read it. And I think it's one of the best chapters, actually, if I say so myself. But it's called, um, well, it's not Conduct After Capture, but it's all about the Conduct After the CAC course, which was, do you remember it, Tim? I don't want to do it again. Never do it again. Never do it again. I've just done my order book and um, I was reading it out. I actually got quite emotional when I was reading the chapter. But you know what? It's the one chapter I read. The It's the longest chapter in the book. It took me 45 minutes to read this one chapter. Uh, and it's called Conduct Unbecoming. And I did not make one mistake in it because I was so engaged when I was reading it, because it's a really good chapter. So, um, sorry, I'm facing myself. No, 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 do it. It is. I'm, I remember I read that. You know, I read it yesterday, and I was like, yeah, it brings it all back, doesn't it? Yeah, like, good chapter. It, yeah. yeah. It, oh, was brutal. it was brutal. So if you were on the uh, the other end of that, War Graves, you know, because um, there's some people saying, having chased a few pilots through the woods myself, <laughs> did you have different experiences of survival? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Horrific. I, I even did the combat survival and rescue officers course so as i say you know not only can i hide in a bush i can teach you to hide in the bush too that is a skill to have also the way you describe let's say bodily functions throughout that thing that is it's oh, do you know can i just tell you the best comment so i did send my chapter so if someone was mentioned um like in that that chapter i mentioned a guy called jez and so i sent him this chapter I said jez i just want to you know check it's okay because basically we're all friends here, I know. He talks about the fact that he had a loose bowel moment. Let's just say, yes, he did. And I talk about it in graphic detail in the book, uh, when we're lying in a bush, how he'd eaten the out-of-date fudge and basically his bowels were released into his clothing. And I said to him, are you happy for me to do that? And he said, he said the only bit of feedback, I'm classic pilot to pilot, he went, don't call me Ginger. <laughs> and I was like, brilliant, happy with that. So, um, tick. Yeah. And the other one as well, which I truly loved, is the story about Soraya. And Soraya Marshall is now the highest ranking female uh, air commandant, so female air crew officer in the Air Force ever. And she's commandant at Cranwell. And there's, let's just say, a slightly dodgy story about her in a nightclub in Las Vegas with her and I doing a dance scene. And I thought, do you know what? I'm not sure I should really mention her name. Um, so I sent her the chapter and I said, Soraya, are you happy for me to leave this chapter in or to mention your name? I can just take your name out. She went, absolutely not. I want people knowing that I came through the real RAF and it was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. And yeah, I did do a dance scene in Rio's on the stage to try and win a grand. So she said, keep my name in. I was like, brilliant. Good for you, Soraya. I, I, I love the film. I'm not, not going to say why you lost that either because... You, you played a really fair hand there. I think the other girls didn't, did they? So it, it was just rude, rude. Yeah. I tell you, read Outrageous. the about that one. Yeah. And when you talk about the Rio and the witch doctor, I can remember. I, I, you know, we had a navigator called. Well, it doesn't really matter what, what her name is. It's fine. But I remember her. They were playing in the Rio. You know, there's always a bit of music going on, and you do that thing that you everyone has a witch doctor. And a witch doctor, for people who don't know, in the Rio at the top of the vo no voodoo lounge at the top of the Rio Hotel, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. There's a, this is big goldfish bowl of you know dry ice and cocktails, and the, the key the key is have a witch doctor, never have two. Like no, witch, no, never have two. A witch doctor is going to mess you up anyway, and then you can carry on doing other stuff like bouncing around yeah. limos and falling. But two of them is you're you're terminal. You're like on the pavement, unconscious. People having to take you back to bed. And oh, this okay. um this navigator of ours, Jen, I think she piled through maybe just one, and she was going around and. She's getting other people's witch doctors and she was falling over the place and she went up to the drummer and said i want a drum and he's mid-set he said i want a drum and he literally stops playing i've never seen anything like this he's like puts his drumstick down picks he's only small anyway jen she picks picks her up puts her on his leg gives her a stick carries on to the end of the song and it, when it finishes she's like yeah he puts the sticks down picks her up and just throws her away like that <laughs> brilliant oh like, 
that is fantastic. I love that. Yeah. Oh, so when you when you're talking about the Rio, I was like, oh, don't you bring it back, bring it all back now, Vegas. Oh, and again, we're in a small hotel in, you know, small hotel frequented by prostitutes and things like that, as opposed yeah. to staying in a free nice hotel. You know, yeah, always, always. Apparently, they weren't allowed to put the RAF up in case the media back at home got hold of it as a, a, a poor PR story of the fast jet pilots staying in the Rio or staying in, you know, Belushios or something like that. So we had to stay in a crummy crappy hotel which was i got stopped by a police car walking to the garage to get like a sandwich and the police car stopped me in broad daylight and he said what are you doing walking around here i said oh, i'm british i'm just at this hotel here he said get in and he took me back to the hotel he said don't walk around here mate honestly people get killed i'm like i thought you were gonna say what's that dodgy beard doing on your face but that was okay you know it's well, we're not our beers now if you fly in the service, are they? Mike, you know, what Mike Winston gives you, you know, AOC one group takes away, doesn't he, unfortunately? So that's it, exactly. Right. Oh, Any okay. advice? <laughs> I did I did laugh when, when Mike Winston said that. Any advice for people that is just enough to see for the Royal Air Force as an officer, not RN due to class of 2020, but has a lot of flying, people and gliding. Well, you've got to go to the careers office, Harry. Um, keep at it, mate. But the careers office are the people. Uh, it's difficult now, isn't it? But I think they've got some online stuff. And I, I always say to young people, talk it out because there's other things you can do. I did really bad in my A-levels, but I went to um, University of West of England, Bristol Poly, um, University of West of England, and I did a, an H&D in aerospace. And that H&D gave me access onto uh, a degree course. And the Navy loved that, by the way. They love that kind of, uh, it's what talk about failing, isn't it, man? You know, you fail, but you get up, move on, fail, get up, move on. So talk to the yeah. careers office. Absolutely. I I think Harry is actually, um, I think he was one of the cadets that joined me on the Manchester call as well. So hi, Harry, and good luck. Um, I believe that you're waiting to hear from Dartmouth. So good luck, mate. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I've just got a guy into Dartmouth recently, actually. So that's that's fantastic. Look, I don't want to keep you any longer, but I do want people to know where to find you. So I am going to share your, uh, I'm going to share your webpage at the moment, only because I've got it open here. And you can also tell other people where to, this is you coming down here. Oh, is that showing on the screen? Yeah, it's showing yeah, on the screen. Okay. Yeah, me with my very short hair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you've got, oh, there you are, look at that. Look at the eyes of that. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's focused. That's focused. I'll tell you where that was. That was at the top of the um, cheese grater building, top floor of the cheese grater. I was in this room and it's the backdrop of the whole of London behind me. I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> like you've made it now. You know, you've sort of made it. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, uh, right. So, okay. So, you can be found here if people want to um, look you up. I don't know whether you're into social and that kind of weird stuff, are you? Yeah, so loads on Twitter. So, basically, if you type in Mandy Hickson, I think I'm Mandy Hickson on Twitter. I'm Mandy Hickson Speaker on Facebook and on Instagram. And I'm on LinkedIn as well, Mandy Hickson. You know what, guys? Any questions? direct message me i normally try and come back with you as we said don't be offended if it's a short answer nothing personal it's just on fast jet pilot and then you know in the past and i like to make it short and sweet so um but it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you tim and uh, i love what you do as well and i think it's brilliant i've listened to your podcast i think it's fantastic so keep up the uh the good warrior work mate yeah, good warrior work. Thank you. Tigers, all of us. Right. Now, I've got, because I'm a bit new to this thing, I've got to go through an outro. What I'm going to do now, Mandy, is get rid of this. I'm going to uh, just quickly speak to people because I think it's quite important about um, people losing their jobs at the moment. In fact, stay on screen so you might be able to give some advice on this. A lot of people are writing to me saying they're, they're either un unemployed or they're about to get unemployed or they're going to be unemployment when the furlough ends. And one of the things I talk to people about, this is Warrior Wednesday. There's still Thursday left. There's still Friday left. And it's important if you are in your workspace is to really hit the end of the week hard as people are switching off because you can show that you're more invested in the company than other people are. And you might stand a better chance of uh, of saving, you know, saving a job and keeping yourself employed. OK, so drive hard towards the weekend. That's what Warriors do. We work hard on the Thursday, work hard on the Friday and then we chill for the weekend. OK, so I really like that. Um, Mandy, thank you. We may as well go out from here, to be honest with you. Uh, I'll just do then credits. Now, what you guys didn't realize is that when the first credits rolled with a little airplane guy in the, me in the cockpit dancing mandy was also dancing okay because she's getting energy oh, there like, what's it all about it. it was good yeah i was watching you down the bottom there i was like yeah <laughs> so you get a chance now <laughs> to dance your way out of warrior oh, yeah, i'm on for it i want to see everyone dancing imagining them all dancing in their little rooms 
Absolutely. That's exactly what's the route. There is actually a way I need to do this. I need to kind of remove some banners and actually play the, the outro. Right. OK. Well, thanks so much, Mandy. I really appreciate it. Um, until next time, then. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. And hopefully we do this every Wednesday. If you do know someone that wants to come on to the, the Warrior Wednesday to have a chat with me, then by all means, throw them at me at Tim at Fast Hit Performance. I really appreciate your attention. This will go to Facebook now and you'll be able to add comments on it, all that kind of stuff. So thanks so much. And see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.